first of all, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you who still have two uh, events to go and to celebrate, uh, I hope everything goes well. Um, so, welcome to the first, uh, the first of a series of lectures which uh, CIE is putting together, uh, basically for the community, for, for the students, for the faculty, for the staff, for the host family, and um, for friends and family, for everybody that, that's part of the large family of uh, CIE. Uh, the idea is to gather here and to have a, a lecture, if you will, or, a, or an occasion, an event, for us to share something new, something that uh, we may not see every day in our usual classes or in, in our usual work. And so we focused on, on finding a topic that was new and interesting for everybody and that was wide enough so that people from very different backgrounds could find the meaning and, and, and uh, find it insightful and find it entertaining at the same time. Okay? All right, so today we have uh, Ignacio Perin, uh, which um, is a professor whom I know for a couple of years now. I was um, in an event once and saw him uh, in a presentation. And throughout this presentation, he talked about philosophy, physics, mathematics, uh, everything gathered in one, in one topic, and I found that very interesting. Um, he's an academic, he's also a designer, and he's a um, visual, jazz. Okay. Uh, Let's just say an artist. Just say an artist. <laughs> but the way that he finds himself, he, himself I, I found so interesting and so unique that he said we need to have him in one of our, in one of our presentations. So um, the presentation today is uh, called Creativity Beyond the Hype. And uh, so I'm sure we'll see some of that which I saw on one uh, occasion before. Um, and so we will cover this uh, interesting topic of innovation and creativity from very different perspectives, from very different angles. And I'm sure that each of you will be able to find uh, one insight for you to implement in your everyday lives. And um, so with that, without further ado, I leave you with a uh, question. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. And thank you, CIE, uh, for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Happy Thanksgiving to, to all of you. Um, I'm the turkey here. <laughs> and, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to start telling you what, what my life is about for just two seconds. Well, two minutes. But um, so we're not going to get very far. But uh, like everything else, we're going to do. We're not going to go very much in depth into anything. Uh, we've got just about an hour. But I, hopefully, like Andres said, we will be able to get some insights, some ideas about what creativity is all about, um, seen from a different perspective. Like he said, uh, I I am an artist, but I'm also uh, an attorney. I've run a few companies and NGOs. Um, today, uh, this day, I mean, this uh, this year, I'm teaching, and I've been teaching for the last five years at the uh, National Catholic University in Buenos Aires at uh, Puerto Madero. I teach uh, postgrad students. Uh, actually, I teach MBAs, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So uh, it is a very different way of teaching these subjects to what everybody is used to listening to. Uh, like Andres said, I, I like to mix in quite a few different things. Uh, we're going to look at a bit of pop culture as well. Um, that is some of my art. I put it there running beforehand so that you could see a little bit of what I do. Um, I forgot I had, well, I'll, I'll give you some cards of mine afterwards so you can, you can go and have a look. But uh, I basically paint. I got synesthesia, which is a um, benign condition. I'm not going to sort of come into any, any harm to anybody by having synesthesia here. Uh, synesthesia is a very benign condition of the frontal lobe, which actually allows me to, when I listen to music, see... Um, shapes and colors. I don't paint the shapes and colors. I let the, those shapes and those colors influence what I do with my art. And uh, basically I paint with acrylics and, and uh, oil-based paints and I drip some inks and uh, I do some other stuff. I, and I also do some digital artwork. 
which is quite interesting because uh, it's it's quite a new way of doing art. I've been doing my my draft work in digital form, and a curator in Naples, Florida, when I was doing an exhibition, said to me, "Look, your your artwork is your digital artwork is already good enough to be a artwork and not just be kept in a computer." So we started doing that in the States about two years ago, and, and it's going quite well. So um, that's about what I'm about on my artistic career, my teaching career. It's pretty much two minutes. So I think I've, I've done pretty well up to now. Okay, let's see. Creativity beyond the hype. Why the name? Actually, I, I talk about creativity beyond the hype because um, everybody's talking about it these days. Oh, we all need to be creative, we need innovation in our lives, everything has to be new, nothing works, we need things to be uh, different. And in actual fact, everybody gets a little bit hanged up on um, methodologies, on, on what's the latest fad, everybody talks about these days uh, about, um, I don't know, lean startup, which is not nothing, which is not something very new in actual fact. But startup, the startup community knows about this, this kind of th uh, theories. We're going to talk about them afterwards. Or blue ocean, uh, different methodologies which are very good for specific subjects, but which become a little bit, um, I don't know, uh, kind of buzzwords that start lacking meaning, meaning at some point or another. So um, I like always to go back to where we are, who we are, and what do we want to be, and then see how are we going to get there by being more creative and more, uh, more innovative, uh, uh, how are we going to think in a different way, how are we going to take our own lives and, and make them something different. The fact is that uh, in my MBA classes, I always take uh, a few questions at the beginning to get a feel of how people are uh, looking at their careers. And I usually ask them if they can actually give me three words that describe how they feel about their lives. And, and usually, it's quite common, one of them is frustrated. And it's incredible that we are so frustrated in a day and age where we have so much technology, we have so much access to information, we have theoretically at least more time because uh, artificial intelligence, uh, algorithms, uh, software, robots, uh, whatever it is, are doing part of the boring work we used to do. So now, theoretically, we have more time. But in fact, we don't because we many times get involved into a uh, dopamine-induced stupor or because we end up doing other stuff that is not really consequential to where we want to be. And at some point, something happens. And suddenly we say, my God, what am I doing with my life? I'm, I'm. And that's where frustration comes in. And the other thing that happens is that because life is changing so fast, because everything is changing, it's is, is very fluid. Everything is changing constantly. Many, many of our careers are disappearing before our eyes. I mean, we, we don't know even if what we are studying right now is going to exist as a profession 10 years or 15 years from now. So we need the tools to be able to say, okay, if, if life changes, I'm going to change with it. I'm going to ride. I'm going to surf this change rather than suffer it. The thing is that we've been talking about this for a very long time. Sorry. They told us that we would go to the stars and many years ago. We've been repeating the same thing for, I don't know, 60, 70 years. We've been looking at, at, at uh, reading books, watching TV, movies, and we've been talking always about the same things. Uh, we're going to be flying away and we're going to go to the stars. That was a future that everybody envisaged. But the truth is that, and this is going to be part of what we are going to be talking about today, life is not exactly what we think it is for a lot of reasons. Because life is about perceptions and not necessarily absolute realities. 
We were going to go and fly into the stars. The fact is that we're hanging for dear life in this little forsaken stone, traveling at great speeds around the universe. So we're not going anywhere. We're already there. We're already flying around the universe, and, and, and we're already among the stars. Our next trip should be somewhere else, should be as to where we want to be and how are we going to preserve this spaceship that we call Earth that is going to make our lives better and how are we going to do better in, for us and for society, for everybody else. Um, if you don't believe me that we're flying at a very high speed, I'm going to show you. Um, if everybody stands here as we are right now, Every person here is already traveling at about a thousand miles an hour on average, depending on which part of the Earth they are standing on. To that, we've got to add that the Earth is traveling at about 66,000 miles, almost 67,000 miles an hour, as we stand here traveling at 1,000 miles an hour. But that's not it, because the solar system is traveling at about 550,000 miles an hour on top of how the Earth is flying and how we are flying. And the galaxy, in actual fact, is flying around at 2,237,000 2, miles. That gives us a total, grand total of about 2,855,000 miles per hour or 800 miles a second. That's how fast we're all moving right now. Since we're in Argentina, we we'll take it to kilometers. That's about 4 million and a half kilometers an hour or almost 1,300 kilometers a second. Now, why don't we feel it? Why, why do we feel that we're standing still? Because both speed and time are relative. The truth is that it's relative. All that speed that we're talking about is relative to our closest galaxies, and we can measure how fast our galaxy is moving towards their gal that galaxy or away from another galaxy. It's relative to that. But in respect of where we stand now, we're standing still. But we're also moving fast. And life is moving very fast. It's moving so fast that what today is a truth, tomorrow may not be so. In actual fact, everything is changing and always changes. But technology, um, human advancement has made that change even faster. In actual fact, 10, 12 years ago, there wasn't such a thing as a Uber driver. You told somebody, I'm a Uber driver, and said, okay, you drive in Germany, probably. No, a Uber driver is something else. Facebook wasn't there. A big data analyst was not a job. In actual fact, Twitter and iPhone were not part of our lives. A cloud manager, uh, probably a meteorologist, was called a cloud manager about 12 years ago. Today is something else. And you've got a social media manager. Okay, you handle all the parties. No, actually, social media manager is something else. As much as sustain a sustainability manager was not heard of until about eight years ago. A drone specialist. It's considered that we'll need about 20,000 to 30,000 drone specialists uh, on our, on, 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 in the U.S. alone by the year 2020. And I would say that even more probably if Amazon gets away with its drones and everything else. What is happening to us is that we're suffering uh, as much as we're enjoying technology and life. Everything is coming towards us very fast, almost, I, I wouldn't say as fast as we're traveling around the universe, but it's pretty fast. And the truth is that all that information that we're getting there, it's, we could call it an information overload. We're getting so much information that it's very difficult for all of us to distinguish between what is true and what is a lie. I'm not going to talk about fake news today. But what, I'm, what I am going to talk about is the fact that there is a lot of information out there which we take for granted 
and which in actual fact may not be correct. And, and the tools and the, the recognition between what is correct and what is not is something that comes from practice, from work, from getting tools that actually allow us to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. And the first one is, let's check it. Let's check it out. I'm going to tell you a few things that I've picked up around uh, the Internet over the last few months, and you can tell me if it is uh, right or wrong. Uh, more than one million people are floating up in the air every second of the day and night. Is that true or is that false? What do you think? False. Okay, it's actually true. In actual fact, there are a million people riding in planes every second of the day or night in the whole world. We manage in our society to get a million people floating up in the air every single second, which is quite a feat. Uh, or feet off the air, uh, talking in a different way, I mean, taking into account my accent. Uh, more people die from diabetic related illnesses than from smoking. True? True? Anybody else? Actually, it's false. It's not correct. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, but smoking is still a big killer. It's, 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 that's how it works. Uh, there are more people alive now than all uh, who have ever lived before. It is true, exactly. It's a calculation, it's a rough calculation, but we think that there have been about 7 billion people living on Earth before us, and there are about 7.5 billion people living today. So everybody who's here now is everybody who's been here before in terms of numbers. It's, in, it's pretty amazing to think about it. Uh, eating eggs will raise your cholesterol level. What do you think? Okay, how many say true? Because I got I got a fight here. Okay, true. Okay, you got, we, we got a, uh, Okay, we got two eggs here, eh? uh, two hands, th three, four, five, six, seven. Everybody else says it's false. Okay, it's false. In actual fact, the whole thing was made up by a doctor in the late 50s who came up with this uh, study. He was a pretty respectable doctor who, who came up with this study saying that eggs will raise your cholesterol level. And everybody else repeated the same thing as being true. Until somebody about five years ago decided to say, okay, I've never done a study on this. Let's, we've got better technology. Let's do it. And they worked out that it's not. You can eat two, three, four eggs a day. Nothing happens. Um, again, for those of you who are learning right now and those of you who may be teaching right now, everybody talks about that there is such a thing as a learning style, auditory, visual, kinesthetic. Do you think that's true or not? The professor here tells me it's true. Anybody else? Okay, it's false. I'm sorry to say. There is no empirical evidence that shows that there is such a thing as a learning style. What there is and which is true, is that for some people it's much easier to study watching a video sort of makes it very boring. But if, you, if I get you to read a book and, uh, and another person to watch a video on that and somebody else to listen to the audio book, the information that each one is going to get, it's going to be roughly about the same even though each one of them chose which way they found it easier and more pleasant to do. Uh, so it has to do with how, how it makes you feel. It may affect the final outcome because obviously one way you're very bored and the other way you're having a good time. But in general terms, empirically at least, there is no real difference. In the last 20 years, the percentage of the world population in extreme poverty has doubled. True? Well, I'm sorry to say, but, it, well, I'm happy to say, in fact, that, that it's actually halved. It's 50% of what it was 20 years ago, in percentage terms. That's, that's the actual fact. Stroke has gone down from being the third to the fourth cause of death in the U.S. This is a tricky one. Actually, it's true, but it's true not because um, there are less people dying uh, from stroke. 
and from other types of deaths, it's because we've managed to keep people alive with strokes much longer. So they finally die of other reasons. But the number of people that get a stroke in the U.S. every year is exactly the same. It just, there is a higher survival rate. But, but so it's true, but it's kind of uh, a gray area there. Uh, uh, this one is easy. The Earth, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not reading as well as I used to. The Earth is at the center of the universe. False. Okay, there's somebody I know who Pope John Paul, I think, decided to forgive for making the heretic um, statement that the earth was not at the center of the universe. The truth is that we don't know. The truth is that we don't know. Why? Because if the universe is finite, we're definitely not at the center. But if the universe is infinite, as there is no such a thing as a one center of an infinite number. Anything can be considered the center. So if the universe is infinite, we can decide ourselves that we are the center of the universe, and it will be fine. It's correct. So it will depend on something that we are not sure about. But if you think it is infinite, we can be at the center. If it is not, we're definitely not there. And one more thing. I don't need glasses. Now, um, Hans Rosling, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was, because he passed away last year, a Swedish um, professor, a very well respected, uh, one of the world's top statisticians. Uh, he um, actually proposed a very interesting theory about the fact that the planet was not going to get over 11 billion people. And he showed why we would not go over that magic number. Um, and uh, it caused a lot of discussion because a lot of people think that it's true because the way he presented it uh, with information that it's quite hard fact information uh, sort of works out quite neatly and some people say that it's, it's not. So those movies that show you uh, hungry zombie apocalypse with about 25 billion people in, on the planet, probably not true. But we may still be eating each other with only 10,000 or 10 billion. Um, he actually had a, a test that it's in, in a YouTube video, if you want to look at it. It's, it's, he's got several YouTube videos. He's very entertaining as well. Uh, n not like me, but, but, but he's very good. And one of the things that he, he showed was this. He said that he was actually asked by uh, the Swedish, uh, Swedish university, a top university, to teach a new course to some of the top students in Sweden about um, uh, human um, uh, health issues around the world. So he said, okay, I need to find out whether these guys need me or not. I mean, is there a need for a, for a, for a subject like this in this university? So he went out and put out a, a, a little questionnaire, uh, multiple choice questions, and decided to say, okay, th th tell me what is right and what is wrong. These are some of the top students in Sweden. So he said, okay, we're going to put this uh, on, on the table for this. Uh, what is the highest ch child mortality between these five pairs? And what he said is, I'm going to make it easier for you. One of the two in each one of the lines is 50% higher than the other one, just to make it easier. Okay. So, Sri Lanka or Turkey, Poland or South Korea, Malaysia or Russia, Pakistan or Vietnam, Thailand or South Africa. His top students got an average uh, correct response of 1.83. So, almost two answers correct for every five questions. The correct answers are Turkey, Poland, Russia, Pakistan and South Africa. Now, he said, that's really strange. I mean, uh, on the one hand, he says that very uh, with his Swedish accent, which is much better than mine, uh, my Spanish accent, but uh, and, and nicer. Uh, and, and he says, 
Well, I realized I had something to teach. But then I said, okay, these guys are very intelligent. How come I got only 1.83 correct, an correct answers for every five? So he made the same questions, he presented the same questions to some of the professors at the university, and they got 1.9. And so he said, okay, I'm going to pick up some chimps, and I'm going to ask the chimps, which is a correct question. And obviously, the chimps got 2.5. Because the chimps, it was just one or the other one, you get a banana, and because it averages out, they get 2.5. So what does it happen to a human being that when it's going to answer something like this, even with a lot of knowledge, a chimpanzee will get better marks. And the truth is that our education and everything that we know, all that information that we've been talking about that is bombarding us at every moment, is generating into us what it's called a knowledge bias. We think we know. We have preconceived ideas about everything. When we go there, we say, okay, uh, well, highest child mortality should be Sri Lanka because they are poorer than Turkey. Or um, South Korea over Poland, obviously. Or, or Malaysia. Russia is a European country. And in actual fact, the correct questions are Turkey, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. So what is making us do this? On the one hand, it's all that information. There's no question about it. As I said before, we think we know. In actual fact, most of us are encyclopedias of useless information. We have a lot of knowledge, but we have no way of proving if what we're saying is right or wrong. But we read it somewhere, we think we do know. Yeah, it's right. I read it. That guy's blog is pretty good. I know it's right. And, and the other thing that makes us think this way is the fact that to study, to be able to scientifically know something, we need to start from any experiment, from a preconception, from an idea which is then questioned and then which is analyzed and we decide if it is correct or not. The whole system is geared towards black and white questions when we're kids, Correct gets you a good mark. Incorrect gets you a bad, bad, bad mark, and a few years ago, even a spanking. And um, uh, the truth is that uh, the whole system is geared toward us going correct or incorrect. Incorrect is bad, we should avoid it at all times, and correct is good, you are on the right path, you are gonna make it big. And the truth is that life is a little bit of correct, but we're not too sure, too sure how much. It is a bit of incorrect, we're not too sure how much, and a lot of gray in between. Life is not as clear as that. When we talk about art, artists, whether we are writers, painters, musicians, uh, sculptors, whatever, we sometimes start with a general idea of what we want to do but then we let it flow. We make it work. We, we let whatever we make tell us what it wants. And we are responsive and open to what whatever we're doing is generating on us and hopefully will generate on others. The thing is that we live in a pretty uh, let's call it monetary-based society. We all want to make money. The truth is that I want to make money, you want to make money, we want to be successful, we want to do well. So everybody comes up with methodologies, different systems. Many of these you probably heard of before. Some of them probably you look at them for the first time. And in here, I think we don't have lean startup or design thinking, which is kind of the big buzzword of the day. Um, started in Stanford by a guy called Kelly, 
who's very smart. He's he he's a cancer survivor. He's a brilliant person. He's actually the the CEO of of Ideo, which is probably one of the best design companies in the world. And uh, the truth is that. All these systems that we, if, if you work in a company, they'll come and say, okay, next week we'll have uh, whatever, a visual brainstorming session with an expert and we're going to do this, which is fine. All of these things will teach us something good, but none of them are the solution to our lives or to our problems. They're part of the solution. The truth is that as human beings, we're always trying to look for the answer. I mean, like Jack Palance said in that famous movie, you've got to find out what this is. Well, in actual fact, life is, is about this and, and, and your toes and everything else. There, there are millions of answers around, and you've got to choose which ones you want to do. The truth is that because society is moving so fast and technology is freeing us somehow, which is the positive side of technology, is freeing us from a lot of things. It's allowing us to do all these things. Before I needed somebody to do it, I would have never have been able to do this on my own 10 years ago. I remember my dad, when I was a kid, buying an IBM computer. We lived in Australia. I grew up, oh, I didn't say that. I grew up in Australia. I grew up, I was born here, grew up in Australia, lived in Malaysia, lived in um, Great Britain for two years, um, worked for a US company for quite a, a bit of time as well, um, I lived in Argentina, obviously. Um, and uh, we lived in Australia. My dad decided for his company to buy an IBM computer. He had 640K of RAM. Yes, it was a brilliant piece of machinery. It had about, I think, um, 64 megabytes of hard disk drive, and it cost $10,000. And um, obviously, I can put about 10,000 of those in this little phone, which costs about 200 bucks. So the truth is that technology is moving very fast. And, and, and we're trying to look for answers that will be our answers to my problems that go beyond the, the problem that I've got in front of me and, and goes far into, into the horizon, into my life problems. How am I going to solve this? If I know this, maybe, if, if not if I use experts, which is the easy way out. But, but the truth is that, or so-called experts sometimes, but the, the truth is that we're all looking for an answer. And as teachers, in the, in the, from, from my perspective, we're also trying to provide every one of you with an answer and trying to provide you with help. But the thing is that we're unloading on you a lot of information. You're taking that information when you feel like it, and if you don't feel like it, you don't take it because you think you've got better information than the one I'm giving to you. A bit like it happens with this guy and his belt. Um, he's just fed up with everything, and he's just throwing information around. It's, uh, this is a teacher, and uh, you are, that, that belt is the students, and we're throwing things around and seeing what sticks. And the truth is that it's logical that that may happen, because I'm coming to you with information that may not be up to date, because... Today, it was fine, but tomorrow when I go, go to class, there may, something may have happened that already changed everything I knew. And perhaps because you're online all day or, and all night, by tomorrow morning you know about that and I don't. And therefore, what I'm unloading on you, it's not what you want to hear. You want to know why this other thing now is the truth and why it's not. The thing is that it pushes us and it, 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 it puts a lot of pressure on you to learn, or, or on how to learn, and on us who teach you uh, to keep up to date, or at least think, how, how are we going to do it? And the best way that we can think of doing it is saying, okay, look, I'm going to teach you about, um, I don't know, entrepreneurship. And uh, these are the rules today, but I don't know how the rules are going to be 10 years from now. I don't know. I don't know if 10 years from now I'm going to be teaching or there is going to be this robotic kind of dog that talks and, and teaches you instead of me. And I don't know if we're going to be teaching this or this is not going to be longer, any longer be taught to anybody because in actual fact this uh, degree is no longer necessary because we have now uh, a software engineer who came up with some algorithms that are 
work out the whole thing much better than we used to. The truth is that we have to teach you for a future that neither you nor I, we, know what it's going to be. We're going, like Star Trek, searching for stars in the middle of space. Uh, we are in space already, as I said before, but who, who, I wouldn't care less. Probably you wouldn't either, because it doesn't affect you so much as this, which does affect you much more. Now, one of the things that, that have actually made it so difficult for us and for you to break free from all the things that we, we heard and all the information that we were fed when we were kids is the fact that many years ago somebody came up with that brilliant idea. The world is divided between creative people and non-creative people. So, creative people, which many, when you say, oh, he's creative, you think artsy. But it goes beyond that. It, it, in, in actual fact, being creative probably means, it means if you are in a company, that you're guaranteed to have a room with a ping pong or a table tennis uh, set and some video games and free coffee and drinks, beer on Fridays. And we expect these creative guys to come up with really smart ideas. And then us, non-creative but serious, organized people, We'll actually take all that stupid information and we'll make it into this really engaging product that it's going to sell like hell. And in actual fact, for many years, everybody thought that. So when you were a kid, you were told, okay, look, you're not creative, but you should do something else. Oh, you, mathematics is your thing. Or uh, whatever, whatever it is. The truth is that um, we've learned that thanks to technology, which has freed us a little bit, we have enough time to search around and see what our, are our real talents. I'm not going biblical here, but what I want to say is that we have all been given a number of talents. And I'm not saying anything new. It's not one. It's not even two. Maybe, I don't know, whatever. And the truth is that we've been told that we had to concentrate on one, and if we concentrated on that one, we were going to have a successful life. The truth is that when, when I don't know, my parents' generation was walking around uh, with, I don't know, 35, 40 years of age, on average, they would have two jobs in their lives unless bad times came along. But, but uh, in the case of my dad, he's an engineer, he, he probably you know, worked for some engineering company when he was younger, and then he put on his own company, and that's what he worked on for the rest of his life. The fact is that for my generation already, it's about five, and for your generation, maybe as high as eight, nine, ten jobs in your lives. And many of those jobs will have nothing to do with the things that you're studying right now. So how do I prepare you, and how do you prepare yourselves to do things that you didn't study for? Well, the truth is that we're all creative, and so we have naturally the tools to do that. To do that, we need to loosen up certain restrictions that society and the system and ourselves have put on, our family sometimes, uh, um, have put on us. Sometimes we're afraid to make fools of ourselves. Sometimes we think, oh, what are they going to say? Oh, I mean, that is going to go crazy if I don't go to the law firm. I mean, uh, I want to play the guitar, which may not be the best idea. I don't know. I'm not saying that that's what you should do. But what I'm saying, because that is going to come and kill me instead of you. But the, the truth is that in general terms, we need to find out what our talents are and be ready to use them and be prepared to nourish them as time goes by so that when the time to change arrives we are not lost instead of suffering the wave of change and and crying because we everything's being washed we are prepared to surf 
that wave and do our best and enjoy it. The truth is that even though we're all creative, we're not exactly the same type of creatives. Some are artistic, some uh, have um, gifts which are naturally endowed by, by nature. Uh, things are easier this way or that way. But then everything else can be learned. And this is part of what I'm trying to get to you tonight. Everything can be learned. Everything can be understood if we put in the time, the effort, we, we enjoy it, we study it. Um, I always tell my students at university, which is probably, don't, don't repeat this, uh, but uh, I, always, I always tell, well, I told the university anyway, but um, sometimes I tell them, okay, don't, don't read the book. Just, I mean, the guy that wrote the book has two or three very interesting conferences on YouTube. Listen to him. You don't have to read the book. Just go and, and listen to YouTube uh, or watch YouTube and, 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 and see the videos. In actual fact, the, the modern-day library, the modern-day encyclopedia, it's not Google. It's YouTube. In YouTube, you find absolutely everything. Every, every, everything that you even haven't thought of will be there. So the fact is that it's much easier sometimes to sit down and watch a video for 30 minutes and if it is interesting, maybe you'll feel inclined to go and buy the book, or I'm not going to say that you should download it, and uh, um, from from some 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 shady website. But the fact is that there are ways in which you can get the information, learn, and get involved. You should do it in the best possible way for you, uh, and, and we should make it easier for you to get into that information. Because once you, if, if I tell you, okay, you've got to read that book from page 100 to page 150 by, I don't know, the day after tomorrow, and I want to hear what it's all about, the fact is that uh, probably two of you are going to read the book, and then they're going to give notes to everybody else, and then uh, they're going to have a little bit of feedback. In, and, and then the truth is that uh, two guys know the book, everybody else just, just heard about it. And, and I'd rather have you all watch a uh, one-hour video by the author, which is going to be a lot more insight than, than reading only 20 pages of the book. And maybe I'll get you interested enough to go and read more about it. And as it usually happens, that's the result. Everybody's reading. Everybody who complained that they didn't want to read, now they're all reading. Why? Because they came into it in a different way. We have to find anything that you're interested in is in there. And the truth is that it's in us. The truth that is that creation, innovation, change, it's in us. Technology is a product of m man's mind and efforts. It is a wave but it's a wave we created. We haven't been able to learn to write it yet. But it's got its good points. The truth is that inside ourselves, we have all that information, just like that pencil has unmentionable things or un unthought of, unfathomed uh, um, what is it? And fathom things that, 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 that it has inside. And it's just a question of putting it on paper, hopefully not on a wall, and just start doing it. I always, have, I always say this. I mean, uh, the truth is that life, it's, it's a bit like a car. And uh, uh, to be able to ride a car, you need to learn the basics, which is just putting the key on, and if it's an automatic, just putting the right gear, uh, knowing where to turn, how to do the turning signals, uh, accelerators, uh, brakes, etc. But at some point, you've got to start moving it. It's impossible to drive a car which is parked. So once you learn all those things, you've got to start moving. And it doesn't matter if, if, if for your life it's moving at 10 miles an hour and for somebody else it's 100 miles an hour. The important thing is that you move. Once you start moving, all those things that you learn will become natural to you. And you'll have the opportunity to look and see what else can you do. The fact is that once you learn to drive, you're not thinking about it, where goes third gear. You, you just do it. 
And then you can talk to your friends, or you can listen to the radio, or you can think about the things you've got to do. And life itself is a little bit like this. It's exactly the same. And, and that process is called neuroplasticity. It was, what is it? It's, it's our neurons and, uh, make connections. And those paths that we make in our brains will start giving us the incentives to go even further. We start getting these little networks of ideas that start working within our brains. And it used to be the idea as well, because technology wasn't there, that neuroplasticity was something that it was basically for the young. In actual fact, that's not true. An 80-year-old has neuroplasticity. It's much more difficult for him or her, but it's still there. And they can learn new things or unlearn bad things. And it has to do with the fact that we need to move. Because we're already moving 2 million, how much have we said? 2 million, 600,000 miles an hour. Well, the world is moving as well, and we need to move with it. And, and, and the truth is that when we, we learn new things, there are behavioral changes in our brain. Um, it, it begins to highlight the things that we like and we do all the time, and it starts discarding all the things that we don't like, and it, it gives us uh, sort of a little, I don't know, a little boost when we do things that we really enjoy. Uh, obviously, there are some relation to genes here that, that I'm not going to get into right now, uh, uh, that some people are genetically more inclined to, to have more elasticity and others a little bit less, but th th that's not important for this talk. The fact is that we all have that possibility. We are, all are capable of learning new stuff. And it, 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 uh, it is something that is good for you, and it's good for me as well, because I'm supposed to be learning new stuff all the time. Now, within the people that, uh, this is just an example, within the people that actually learn a lot, there are those who are called hyper-creatives, are people that redefine time constraints. What does it, does it mean to redefine time constraints? There are people that live in, at this time, but are, be, are able to see the future. Maybe that's what in, in tribes around the world, or whatever we're called, the, the, the witch doctor, the guy that, in actual fact, what maybe he had, was that kind of elasticity to be able to see what was going on and say, hey, guys, I think next year we're going to get a lot of rain and we're going to get wiped out. And so we better move over there rather than stay over here. And everybody used to say, my God, this guy is great. And the, and the fact is that what he had was this neuroplasticity, this capacity to see and listen and be aware of whatever is around him, uh, listen to others, be flexible, and those are things that we can learn to do as well. This is one, What's Arthur C. Clarke. In 2001, you're projecting us into the 21st century. I brought along my son Jonathan, who in the year 2001 will be the same age as I am now. Maybe he will be better adjusted to this kind of world that you're trying to portray. The big difference when he grows up, in fact, he would want to go into the year 2001, is that he will have in his own house not a computer as big as this, but at least... You know who Arthur C. Clarke is? I'll tell you later. Okay. ...to his friendly local computer and get all the information he needs for his everyday life, like his bank statements, his theater reservations, all the information you need in the course of living in a complex modern society. This will be in a compact form in his own house. You'll have a television screen like this here and a keyboard and you'll talk to the computer getting information from it and it'll take it as much for granted as we take the telephone. I wonder though, what sort of a life would have been like in social terms I mean, if our whole life is built around the computer we become a computer dependent society and a computer independent individuals. In some ways but they'll also enrich our society because it'll make it possible for us to live really anywhere we like. Any businessman and executive could live almost anywhere on earth and still do his business through a device like this. And this is a wonderful thing. It means we wanted to be stuck in cities, we better live out in, in the country or wherever we please, and still carry on complete interaction with human beings as, as well as with other computers. Arthur C. Clarke 
is a scientist. He was one of the first guys to work on, on the first satellites that the U.S. put into space. Then he decided to retire and start writing, and he wrote Space Odyssey 2001, and then he wrote Space Odyssey 2010, and then he wrote a lot of other books. He is, as you can see, in 1974, he's describing what our life is, life is today. He had a very clear idea. He was open-minded. Minded. He was eager to know. He had knowledge. And he said, I'm going to tell you what life is going to be like in 40 years from now. And he was right. I don't think there is anything, almost anything wrong in anything he said. These are guys that are connected beyond time. They can see beyond everything. These are our witch doctors. They can see beyond. And we can too. It's, it's a very special gift. But the truth is that it's easier when you see yourself as part of a whole system rather than see yourself as an individual. We come from, we're coming at the end of uh, a generation that made the world great, which is really the baby boomers. They went through war, their parents went through war, and then they, they, they came and we are the result of that world. But that world that, that was based on personal effort and working hard and, and, and getting there and success had a B-side that wasn't so good. It, 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 the, the people became a little bit entitled as well. They began to think that if you didn't make it, it was because you didn't make a big enough effort. And sometimes it's very difficult to make a big enough effort when you don't have the right conditions to, to sort of grow or when you are trying to do something you don't like and so everything is stressful and slow and you got to go through it but it, really you dream every day of doing something else which by the way still even when you're doing something you like if you're at school or university you're still thinking you'd like to be do somewhere else doing something else but be, that's beside the point the, 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 what I'm saying is deep inside when you know you're doing something because your parents told you come on I need another lawyer in the, in the, in the, in, in the family and, and you're studying law and you would rather be I don't know an architect or be uh, whatever you want to be and, and sometimes you go, we have to come to grips with these sort of things when, when we think ourselves as part of a system, it's much easier to make those decisions. When we think we are at the top of the, of, of the food chain, it's, it's much easier to disregard everything else and think that, that we are great. The fact is, as I always say, I have a, a, a black Labrador. Her name is Pancha, which in Spanish means basically quiet and lazy, and she's pretty quiet and lazy. And, uh, but the fact is that Pancha has a um, pretty good understanding of Spanish. I tell her, okay, what do you want? Do you want to go and pee or do you want a cookie? And she'll decide, okay, like, I want to pee or I want a cookie or I want this or what. She'll make herself understood. The fact is that if she lived in China and somebody said that in Chinese, that black lab would understand Chinese. And if you say it in English and lived in London, then she would understand English. I don't know any one of us who understands dog. The fact is that the truth is that necessity will make us push ourselves harder and try to understand. And also the truth is that as high as we think we are in the food chain, in the, food chain the truth is that there are certain things that we cannot do that others do. I mean, if bees disappear tomorrow, we're all doomed. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. So the fact is that once we see ourselves as part of an ecosystem that has to be sustainable in time, we st begin to understand how to do things correctly. We begin to place ourselves in the right place, in, a, in the right mind to be able to do all these things. And uh, as much as we've been talking about space and the final frontier and everything else, the truth is that scientists, as we've seen with, with Arthur C. Clarke, and I can talk about, I'm not going to talk today, I'm not going to bore you with that, but we could talk about Einstein, and, and, and we could talk about Hawking, and we could talk about uh, Gelman, and we could talk about a lot of scientists. They all coincide in certain aspects and in certain points about how life is all, what life is all about. Because 
there is an influence of quantum mechanics and science in their thinking. And that influence is not that bad, because once you see how the universe works, you realize that your life, because you are made up of the same stuff that stars are made of, the truth is that Hindus talk about, you know, rebirth with, you know, you, you were a butterfly and then you become something else. The truth is that, uh, I mean, I'm a Christian, but, but there is some, uh, there's some reason behind that. Because the fact is that, uh, I don't know if you know this, but when the, when the Big Bang happened, the Big Bang happened, all matter in the universe was created instantly, or at least that's the theory. You cannot create any more matter than what there is out there. So we have expansion of matter, and everything that happens afterwards, it's made up of the same stuff. So there may be molecules in here that belong to a dinosaur 300,000 years ago, and maybe something that was in a star a billion light years away, a billion light years ago. The truth is that we are all made up of the same stuff as the universe. So the same rules that apply to the whole system, to the planets, to everything else, applies to us and our lives. We are the same thing. And so it's logical that some of the rules, like this, are, this, this is not sort of philosophy, this is quantum mechanics. Uh, this is, these are all basic ideas that most societies agree on. All similar problems have a similar structure. The truth is that if you think about problems that are similar to, uh, that, that happen to you and they have similar results, they're usually similar in structure. There may be some component that has changed, but usually they're pretty much the same. Most complex issues tend to be composed of layers of similar issues with a much smaller and also similar problem at its center. They call it the onion effect. It's, it's like taking layers of an onion and then you get a, a smaller onion and a smaller onion and a smaller onion until you get to the center of it, which is just a little onion. When, when, if you worked in, a, in an office um, and there is a big problem and everybody is arguing and, and, and things start rippling away from, from, from what happened, uh, the truth is that if you get involved with what happened over here and forget what happened at the center, what is going to probably happen is that you're not going to solve the issue. You've got to go to the center of the problem. And the center of the problem is very similar to what you're seeing here. In the case of the spa of space, may be the collision of two planets. In the case of an office, may be the collision of two egos. But it's basically the same thing. They shock, they, they clash, and then the expansive wave just takes over everything and ruins everybody else's lives as, as the expansive wave of, of, of two planets colliding will start heating all the other planets and changing orbits and changing things. Um, and so on. I mean, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to move forward from here, but, but you probably had a chance to read some of this. But the, the fact is that the rules are pretty similar for everything else. Why? Because everything is connected with everything. Anybody, I mean, for artists at least, we all believe that everything is connected with everything. It's, it's, it's a very common way pattern, a, a, a common thinking pattern that, that, that people that are creative have. Because we realize that, that we've got to make stuff out of nothing. The truth is that a musician makes stuff out of nothing. An artist makes stuff, a painter like me, I, I make stuff out of nothing. I just, uh, I mean, somebody else picks up the same ideas and, and they do something else. A writer. Uh, and, and then what we do takes over our lives as well. Writers usually talk about the fact that, that, that the characters in a, in a novel will start telling them what they want to say. And when they make them say something that, that goes against character, the character is going to be annoyed. <laughs> and he's going to tell them, no, 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 I don't want to hear that. Uh, I should be saying this. So, how do we keep our minds open? And, and here we're coming to the, to the, to the end. Uh, to the, it's not the end, but we're going towards the end. Um, how do we keep our minds open then? Thinking that uh, we need to, to do things differently, we need to be open, we need to realize that everything is changing, we need to pick up tools and, 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 and recognize where our possibilities may lie ahead that, that were not there just two days ago 
and and where the things that we thought were there two days ago are no longer there. Uh, in fact, um, I don't know. There's a, there's a McKinsey report that came up in 2017 that says that about 800 million jobs will be lost to technology by the year uh, 2030, and about 75 million of those jobs in the U.S. alone. And that work is going to be taken over by artificial intelligence and technology. That doesn't mean that you're going to be out of a job. That means that you've got to do something different. So you've got about 10 years of what you're doing now, and then you're going to start thinking, what else am I going to do now? And one of the things you can do is to keep your mind open. And then I'm going to give you a few hints of what else you can do. For a start, you don't put resistance to change, but let it flow. Let it flow. Albert Einstein, who I just mentioned two minutes ago, and obviously he realized that because now he's here, um, he, he used to be considered an artist more than a scientist. He used to work in a really different way than what most scientists are used to work. They're, they're very methodical, they're very uh, neat. No, Einstein's uh, desk was a mess. He, uh, he used to uh, come up with ideas and write them on a board, and, and, and uh, uh, he was not afraid to question what everybody else said was correct. He, because one of the key elements of, of knowledge in the 21st century is not only learning the basics, but then learning how to push boundaries and break stuff. If you like breaking stuff, this is your century. This is great. Because the truth is that we need to break stuff. Uh, a magic solution with a methodology that is going to solve all your problems. I am, uh, here's my bill for $50,000. Um, it's not going to solve anything. What is going to solve everything is if you, if you study what this guy is saying or this, this, this woman is saying, you, you pick up the things that are really important to you, you, you look at somebody else and make up your own methodology. Just last night I was teaching at the university and uh, I was um, uh, talking about lean startup technology, which is something that, uh, that um, Eric Rice, uh, an American author, came up with uh, a decade ago approximately. But lean startup is, uh, is basically what Henry Ford used to do in the 1900s. And then a Japanese guy called Ono uh, that used to work for Toyota came up with a different system, but based on basically what Ford used to do. And then that got changed into something else, and then that got changed into something else. And then Eric Rice made it into a lean startup. Everything connects with everything, and everything in life is really a remix. So if you're open-minded and you're ready to break stuff and pick up from the past. That's why history is so important. I mean, if, if, I don't know, I, I loved history when I was a kid, but history is very important because it's impossible to go to the future without knowing what came before and without taking advantage of all the things that came before. They say that for a novel entrepreneur to, to really make it these days, he, needs, he or she need five things. They need money, they need ideas, they need uh, a good team to work with, they need um, a good business plan, a good business model, and they need good timing. Of all of those, you would have thought that having the money to start the business is the most important one. Well, it doesn't matter who you talk to, it doesn't matter what economist uh, report you read, the number one is timing, is doing things at the right time. The second one is having a good team. You do it at the right time with the right people. Then the idea comes along. Then the idea is the important part. And then what's your business model or your business plan? And finally, the money. Because if you have all those four, the money will come to you. You don't have to go looking for it because you've done the right things. If you haven't done the right things, you start looking for the money first. And then you say, okay, I'm going to get the money. It's, it's, it's off, guys. We cannot do it. So the, the truth is that 
to be able to get there, to be able to do all these things, we need to go for something connected to the, the let it flow thing, which is simplicity. We need to make things simple. So, first lesson, let it flow. Make it simple. Scientists always say that simple and elegant solutions will always tell you the way towards correct answers, while convoluted, complex, difficult to understand solutions will probably be wrong. And most of the times, it works out that way. So, make it simple, understandable, uh, let it flow. Um, in 1915, uh, Einstein wrote to his son, who was having trouble at school. And he said, the best way to learn was doing something in a way that it allows you to enjoy every moment so much that you, don't know, you do not realize that time is passing. So the last one for Let It Flow is enjoy it. Psychologists call it state of flow. long after uh, Einstein and obviously Batman were talking about this. Um, and the truth is that most artists will talk about this state of flow as part of our sort of creative process. It's part of what we do. Second one, we've got to decide about our lives. What is it that we want to do? Do we want to make money or do we want to create meaning? The truth is that we all want to make money. Most, I mean, I, I teach entrepreneurship, so I always ask my students, okay, do you want to make a company? What, what do you want to do? Okay, and so, what do you want to do? And I, what do you want to do? Oh, well, I want to make money. Okay. So what? I mean, everybody wants to make money. So if you know anything about mathematics, if something is common to all the equations, it's a given, it's, it's something that doesn't count. So. Tell me what do you want to do? And that's when we start talking about creating meaning. What does it mean, creating meaning? It means that when we talk about innovation in the 21st century, we talk about much more than just creating a company and making money. We're talking about doing, building, uh, uh, thinking about um, how are we going to progress into the future with whatever we're doing. It means about being uh, empathic. In other words, uh, thinking about others. And when you start thinking about others, you are, you are thinking about sustainability, which is very important as part of the whole process. Uh, if you are sustainable, you're sustainable in regards to the planet. You're sustainable in regards, in regards to your community. And you're sustainable in time. And it means understanding that when we create value, we do it for ourselves and for the society that is around it. If you, uh, I mean, this is, again, history. I was saying, uh, let's say that, that, that you, you grew up in a little town in the U.S., for example, and, and the town had a big company there that worked always. And the company didn't do anything for anybody in town. It just gave jobs. Didn't care about whether the school was, I don't know, the school roof was leaking or... They just worked there, they made their money, and obviously they, they contributed to the, the well-being of the town by being there and giving jobs. But that was it. When bad times come along, the town doesn't have a connection to the company other than they gave us our jobs, now they're going, we don't have any more jobs, what are we going to do? If the company has a relationship with the town where they're part of the community, instead of when bad times hit, they're part of the problem, they become part of the solution. Everybody wants to help the company because the company is the town. It's the same thing. So when you talk about a little company, your, your own startup, when you talk about any business that you're starting, if you're thinking about being part of a community, you have many more chances of being sustainable both financially and in time than if you just think about making money for the short term.
It's the truth. In the long term, you're going to make more money. So on top of that, it's good for you. I mean, if you don't do it because you believe it and because you are nice and you want to think about the people that you got around, do it because you're going to make more money. You're going to make more money. It's good. And, and um, creating meaning is something that I don't know if you go, know this guy, Guy Kawasaki. He, he used to work with, with Steve Jobs. Uh, he, he's got some really nice videos on YouTube if you want to look at him. He's pretty funny. He's, he's very good. And he always talks about the fact that it's very important to make value uh, beyond the, the idea that we all want to make some money. And, and, and making value means that you've got to have a clear idea what your core values are, whether they're personal, they're professional, or they have to do with your company. And your organization will have more credibility, more profitability, uh, and uh, if, you, if you keep close to your core values that if you throw them by the window. It's a fact. I'm not making this up. Next, I'd like you all to be a little Sherlock. And also a little bit Dirk. I don't know if you know Dirk Gently. Have you watched Dirk Gently on Netflix? Okay. Um, for those who don't know who they you all know who Sherlock is, but... There's a margin for error, but I'm pretty sure there's a 747 leaving Heathrow tomorrow at 6.30 in the evening for Baltimore. Apparently it's going to save the world. Not sure how that could be true, but give me a moment. I don't even know the case for eight seconds. Oh, come on, it's not code. These are seat allocations on the passenger jet. Look, there's no letter I because it can be mistaken for a one. No letters past K. The width of the plane is the limit. The numbers always appear randomly and not in sequence. But the letters have little runs of sequence all over the place. Families and couples sitting together. And your jumbo is wide enough to need a letter K all rows past 55, which is why there's always an upstairs. There's a row 13, which eliminates the more superstitious airlines. Then there's a the style of the flight number 007 that eliminates a few more. And assuming the British point of origin, which would be logical considering the original source of the information, and assuming from the increased pressure on you lately that the crisis is imminent, the only flight that matches all the criteria and departs within the week is the 6.30 to Baltimore tomorrow evening from Heathrow Airport. Please don't feel obliged to tell me that was remarkable or amazing. Charles expressed that thought in every possible variant available to the English. Dirk! Oh, don't tell me you're giving up. We've only dug, like, what? 30? Million holes? I think we're in the wrong spot. Like, we gotta double check the map. What if maybe the X's aren't even for something buried? Well, we have to dig somewhere. I mean, I think the ground is a great place to start. You're right. I take it back. You're not psychic. What a relief. Look, it's late. Let's pack it in for the night and try another one of the marks in the map in the morning. You gain nothing from giving up, Todd. Oh, don't start with the Zen Master stuff, okay? It worked a lot better before I figured out you were a mess, too. Fair point, I suppose. But wouldn't it just be one more thing you walked away from? You know, I was thinking about those trap rooms, how you solve them, but then there's always another. And I think... Maybe life is like that too. Just an endless series of rooms with puzzles in and eventually one of them kills you. Yeah, that's dark and depressing. Well, giving up is an answer, I suppose. It would certainly be easier. But it's an easy road to nowhere. What if one more shovel in the dirt is all it would take? Go ahead. One more and then we quit. Nah, you're right, Todd. Let's move back to Kansas and be farmers. Come on. Wait, no, one more, just to prove me wrong. No, when you're right, you're right, and you're right. Let's You want to try one more, try one more. Look, all I was saying is, if you don't try, you'll never know. I get it, but now I can't leave. Yeah. truth is that life also has to be a little bit like this. You've got to be deductive, you've got to reason things through, you've got to look at every detail and try to work out how things 
sort of our place together and come together. But also, you've got to be open to the idea that, that, that life is a big puzzle and you've got to, you've, uh, I'm going to tell you later why it's not exactly like a puzzle, but, but it, it, it's got a lot of parts in it anyway. It's not exactly like a puzzle, but it, it's got a lot of parts in it and you've got to search for them. And when you find them, you may not know what they are. But you know to, you've got to realize that because you found them, you were meant to be there, and you've got to go on. You keep moving. You keep moving that car. You keep moving that car forward, and then you see where that takes you. Uh, they're gently holistic detective agency. It's called the series. It's very funny. But, but uh, um, uh, it's very weird as well, but it's very funny. And, and it's a different kind of detection about what the world is like. And the, the nice thing about... Uh, the, the Dirk Gently, uh, that's why I like it as well, I guess. It's because what we're talking about here, in, in fact, is a holistic view of, of society and or our work, or everything we do. Everything is connected with everything. Everything is part of everything else. The truth is that things get inspired by other things, and then they become other stuff. Uh, you don't know what they are. Like, they're, they're found. It's a thing. I don't know what the hell this is, but we're, we're going to find out. But sometimes those things that we found spark in us um, innovation, creativity, things that are new. In fact, there is a doctor who got inspiration from Aristotle. And that doctor then inspired another doctor to create and write about a detective. That was a doctor called Conan Doyle. And then Conan Doyle created a fictional character that inspired, ended up inspiring the real world that's Sherlock Holmes. And then the real world ends up modifying forensic medicine and police detection methods to copy Sherlock. The truth is that life, a doctor based on life, Aristotle, made up a fictional character then then decided to change reality again by making us go that way. Uh, life is, is very complex, but there is one thing that we all know about it, and is that, uh, or we're finding out today, is that everything really is connected with everything. And um, that's why we must question what we consider to be reality and the facts that we're given. And that's uh, another important lesson here in this question about being a bit Sherlock and being a bit Dirk, is that it's important to have critical self-reflection. In other words, think within ourselves and realize what mistakes have we made. We have to be critical of others, but we have to be critical of ourselves. So also as, a, as something to take away here is that fact, the fact that we need to look at the connection of everything with everything else. We must inspire ourselves in both reality and fiction. It doesn't matter. But we also must be sure then when, that, that as, a, as, a, as an ignition key to our creativity and innovation, innovative juices or whatever you want to call them, it's also the fact that we've got to be aware of our mistakes, of the things that we do, of, of the things that we've done wrong, and correct them. Why? Because reality is uh, an interpretation of each one of us. Each one of us, uh, that's how our brains work, make schemas. The, 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 the sort of neurologists call it that. They're, they're like little photographs that we make of a, a few milliseconds. And then we put together a lot of these schemas, and, and, uh, and uh, they make up a little movie within our minds. And that's a short-term memory. Once those movies have stayed there for a few minutes, they become long-term memory. We make up a movie. We work like a cinema director. And the fact is that if I could pick up the movie of me talking over the last five minutes from each one of your heads and put it on the projector and, and, and say, okay, let's watch it, each movie would be completely different. They're like fingerprints. Because each one of us, because of what we talked before, are looking at different things within the set because you, you have been influenced by other things. 
uh, by your interest because uh, some of you are boring, uh, think think that I'm boring, or some of them, some some of you may think that that uh, the movie was great that was there five minutes ago and still thinking about that. So you're paying attention to the light over there. Uh, the truth is that we make up reality. And, and that's why, for example, when you have a car accident, police will actually ask as many people as they can because to be able to get, if you don't have a, a street camera taking the pictures of the, of, of the accident, the only way to have a clear idea of what happened is look at what several people looked at and then come up with a conclusion because each one of us will react and record in this set of uh, videos that we put into our minds different uh, different things. This is a, 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 because the fact is that we're looking at the world through our eyes, which is just old-fashioned natural technology. And we're listening to our world through our ears, which is just an old-fashioned microphone. And we are talking through the speaker, but, but it's all, not all of them work the same way. This is an old test. Uh, who's angry and who is uh, happy in this picture? Left or right? Who's angry? Huh? Anybody? Right. Right angry, left seems quite okay. Well, I'll bring it over, right, to the front. It's the same one. I mean, I, I'm, not tri I'm not doing a trick here. Let me see if I can. Let me see. It's the same way. Why is that? Because, like I said before, you're looking at the world through a system of old-fashioned technology that can get it wrong. Why? Because your brain, I'm giving you in that picture a, uh, an amount of information that will confuse your eyes. So because the picture is small, your brain will make up the rest. You're, you think you're seeing something, but actually your brain is looking at what the information your eyes is bringing through your, your pupils, and then it's saying, okay, I need to complete this picture to see what, what's in there. When, when I give it all the information, the truth arrives. And normally it happens. Some people actually do see differently, but most people will look at it in the opposite way because your brain is making it up. What color is this? yellow. Well, what if I tell you that this is a projector and therefore your projector only shows colors in green, blue, and red? And so uh, that's, that's basically what the projector is showing. So how am I making yellow out of green, blue, and red? The fact is that we've learned that if we actually bring the wavelengths of the light in a certain manner and we cross over in a certain place, our brains through our eyes we'll see yellow. But the truth is that if somebody has different types of eyes uh, than ours, I don't know, some, some, some alien uh, being that comes here with eight arms and 25 eyes and whatever, they may not see yellow. Because this yellow is made up so that we can see it, but in actual fact it's just uh, fiction for us, for us, created by us. And it works. So how do we know? We make these connections. But the truth is that these connections may lead us the wrong way. Sometimes they say, oh, I saw it. But the truth is that you shouldn't trust your eyes either. And being creative, being um, open to change, has to do with the fact of throwing that little doubt into everything that you, that you see and hear. Because not everything is exactly how we think it is. And that's where we're coming to, to the end, and, and that's where the eye of the artist. That's, that's, that's how I came to the university. I didn't get to be a professor at the university because I'm a lawyer or I have a, I don't know, a degree in politics or because I run a bar association or whatever. I came to the university to teach MBAs because I'm an artist. And because I look at my profession and everybody else's with the eyes of an artist. And what does it mean to have the eyes of an artist? Before I said, life is not exactly like a puzzle. But we're taught when we're kids, and it's a very good exercise, to do puzzles, because that actually does very good things to our brains as we grow up. But the truth is that life is not a puzzle. If it was, or if it were, um, once one of the little pieces is missing, 
we're stuck. And the truth is that in life, more than one piece is always missing. And so we become frustrated. We start thinking that things cannot be done. Oh, change, it's impossible, I cannot do it. I mean, uh, there, there are things missing here. And life is not a puzzle. Life is something else. And I'm going to end today with the idea of what the artistic vision is, which comes very handy for this sort of thing. For an artist, and I'll put it in first person, for me, the order of the pieces is not that important. I just know that I have a lot of pieces, and I'm going to make something. In fact, um, the formality of the contents is not that important. What I want to do is something that is different. I want to do something that is new. And if some of the pieces are left over, I'm going to keep them because I'm going to do something else with that. I'm not stuck by the fact that there are some pieces missing in this picture. And I don't care if nobody understands what I'm doing. Because that's not what it's supposed to be about. What it's supposed to be about is whether what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing it for the right reasons, with the right values, for the correct reasons to, to do it. I want to make money. That's, that's a correct value. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denying that. But, but it's, it's, it's for my satisfaction as well, from the point of view of doing the right things, things that really inspire me. Because sooner or later, people will understand. You know, um, Kevin Costner, Field Dreams, you know, if you build it, they will come. At some point, people will see it, and they'll want to be part of it. With, a, with an artwork, that happens very often. I had a piece of art in my house, mine, for, I don't know, about a year, and there were these friends of mine who used to come to Sundays for lunch or whatever, every now and again, and uh, one day, this girl says, oh, my God, that's a new painting? I said, are you kidding? I mean, you've been looking at it for the last year. And, and she says, oh, no, that's not it. And her husband says, yeah, hon, it's been there for about a year. Oh, I just saw it. It's really beautiful. The fact is that she didn't see it because her brain didn't understand it. At some point from seeing it often and often and seeing it again and again and again, her brain finally said, hey, you know what? That's not bad. And suddenly she saw it. The fact is that we see sometimes what we want to see. And sometimes we see what we understand and we discard what we do not understand. But it doesn't matter. So at some point they will. It's also important to know that for, for us artists, the process is a never-ending learning process. We never think that we made it. We may make we make we make it in in the more sort of standard way in the sense that okay. I, I, I'm selling my art really well, in that sense, a financial uh, uh, income or whatever. But not in uh, what we do. We always think we have somewhere else to go. And, um, and we accept that, that the results matter. We, re we accept that the eye of the other person matters. For that person, my painting was finished when she finally saw it. Until that time, it was finished for everybody else but her. And um, overall, enjoying what we have done, conforming with the ability to work with others. And this is one little point I want to make. People think that artists are individualistic, and we're not. We like working with others. And, and if there's one thing that we're learning in the 21st century is that we're going away from that baby boomer society that talked a lot about me, 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 me. And it, I, I believe, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit naive, but I, I think that 21st century is more about we. It's more about how we as society, has we, how we as a, uh, as a company, how we as an organization, how we as a community will make it through. And that makes it very different from the point of view of how we do things. So I want to leave you finally with um, with this little video.
who would have expected to see uh, Star Trek and Batman in swim pants? <laughs> well, really, everything is connected to everything. That's one of the out, uh, outtakes I, I get from this presentation. Uh, the other thing that triggered in my mind is uh, a quote that said, um, uh, watch your thoughts, because they will become words. Watch your words, because they will become actions. Watch your actions, because they will become habits. And watch your habits, because they will become your character. That's a quote from uh, Margaret Thatcher. And, um, and that quote came into my mind because of the other, uh, another concept that I saw there, which was uh, neuroplasticity. Our brain is very flexible to do everything we want. And so everything that we commit ourselves to do, if we start doing it in baby steps, eventually we'll get there. So it's about imagining what we want uh, to do or to be, and then getting there slowly. Uh, very interesting presentation. And if anything that you saw here didn't trigger something in your head, I think you're another human being. <laughs> um, so we'll be, we go downstairs now. we we'll get something to eat or drink. Uh, in a small way, celebrate Thanksgiving, and, um, and Ignacio will be there with some of his art, which he brought, so we can comment and see and watch and entertain ourselves. Thank you very much.